Hi there, Gordon West, WB6NOA. Welcome to your third module in preparation for your extra class license. Well, we're more than one-third of the way there in preparation for the extra. In fact, when we get through electrical principles, which we're now going to talk about, you'll be more than halfway through. So hang in there, Chuff, and drag out the kid's calculator. You know the one last night you searched all over for? Make sure you've got that calculator handy because we're going to cover nine groups of questions out of electrical principles. Those nine groups dealing with resonant circuits, looking at time constants, looking at impedance, phase angles, algebra, skin effect, circuit Q, effective radiated power, photoconductivity. Oh no! These are the things that I have a problem with when it comes to math. Is that what you're saying? we're going to get you through. In fact, on our audio course, we're going to give you some shortcuts. Now, we want you to have the book handy because the book shows you the long cuts in getting through the examination questions, solving each and every numerical value. We're starting on page 100 of my exclusive Gordon West Extra Class book. On the audio course, we're going to give you shortcuts and for those of you not able to see the book, we're going to be able to give you some very shortcuts that will help you arrive at the correct answer. So don't panic. We're going to get you through electrical principles. Nine groups of questions, nine questions on your upcoming test, and once we're finished with this sub-element E5, you'll be more than halfway there with very little math beyond this in preparation for your extra class test. Okay, let's get started. Drag out that calculator, turn to page 100 in my book, and let's get started with question E5A01. As an extra class operator, you're probably going to be playing around a lot with antennas, especially those antennas on your mobile vehicle for high frequency, as well as those at the house. Antennas may develop a much greater voltage across the reactances in series than the voltage applied to them. And that first question, E5A01, reads, what can cause the voltage across reactances in series to be larger than the voltage applied to them? And that is called resonance. Coils, which have inductive reactants, and capacitors having capacitive reactants will be at resonance when the capacitive reactance equals the inductive reactance. At resonance, large voltages greater than the applied voltage can be present across these components in the circuit. <laughs> You'll really see this on a mobile whip antenna if you hold a fluorescent tube next to it and start transmitting. You'll get that tube to light up nice and bright at resonance. What is resonance in an electrical circuit? Well, that's the frequency at which capacitive reactance equals inductive reactance. And we'll see that depending on the Q, sometimes that's over a very narrow range with a high Q circuit or over a wider range with a lower Q circuit. What are the conditions for resonance to occur in an electrical circuit? Well, remember, inductive and capacitive reactances must be what? That's right, they must be equal. That's good. You're doing a good job. Just keep your eyes on the road. All right. When the inductive reactance of an electrical circuit equals the capacitive reactance, the condition is called, that's right, resonance. Now, what is the magnitude of the impedance of a series RLC circuit at resonance? Now, think about this series circuit like a mobile whip antenna. The impedance, the opposition to the flow of current. Well, at resonance in a mobile whip, like in the coil, impedance is equal to the circuit resistance because capacitive reactants and inductive reactances in that mobile coil have canceled. So the only thing that is going to create impedance is the resistance of that coil. That's why when you're driving down the road like you're probably doing right now and you watch one of those serious hams go by with a serious loading coil antenna, I mean huge wraps of copper wire around the loading coil, that has resonance with very little circuit resistance. 
What is the magnitude of the impedance of a circuit with a resistor, an inductor, and a capacitor in parallel at resonance? And at parallel resonance, the impedance is again equal to simply the circuit resistance. What is the magnitude of the current at the input of a series RLC, R for resistance, L for inductance, C for capacitance circuit at resonance? Now think about this. The current at the input. The input current in a series, like a mobile whip, a serious whip, is going to be maximum. A mobile whip antenna will have maximum current in a series RLC circuit at resonance. Now they ask another question, what's the current at the input of a parallel RLC circuit at resonance? Now parallel, think of like a loading trap, a trap on that 5 band beam antenna. Well what the trap does is it keeps the current maximum inside the trap which means that outside at the input of a parallel RLC circuit, circuit current is at minimum. That's right, so minimum current passes beyond that trap. Everything zooms around on the inside of a parallel, think a trap ending with the letter P and parallel circuit. Now, how about the magnitude of the circulating current inside the components of that parallel RLC circuit. Well, inside the trap, current is at maximum. So be sure and know series where current in a series circuit is maximum at the input, parallel it is minimum at the input, and within a parallel LC circuit at resonance, current is at maximum. What is the relationship between the current through a resonant circuit and the voltage across the circuit? Well, in resonance, the voltage and current are in phase. Now, what do we mean by in phase? That means that voltage and current go up and down exactly the same. They're totally in phase without current or voltage leading the other. They're exactly hand in hand in phase at resonance. Now, what is the relationship between the current into or out of a parallel resonance circuit and the voltage across the circuit? The voltage and the current at resonance are in phase. Now, a little bit later on, we're going to introduce you to Mr. Eli. Now, Eli, the Iceman, it's a strange name, isn't it? is someone that's going to help you through a whole bunch of questions the easy way without having to do any major calculation on your kid's calculator. So don't forget, Eli the Iceman, but we'll tell you more about him later. Let's take a look at a new series of questions dealing with the Q of the circuit, Q for quality. Question E5A12, what is the half power bandwidth of a parallel resonant circuit that has a resonant frequency of 1.8 megahertz and a Q of 95. Oh, I can see those eyes rolling back right now. Don't panic. We're going to talk about Q, which is a quality factor of a circuit, and half power bandwidth. All right, first formula, you need to write this down on a piece of paper, or if you're driving, write it down on the dust on your dashboard. Half power bandwidth is going to equal the frequency divided by the Q. And the frequency will be in kilohertz, and the Q is going to be a hard number. Well, they've already given us the frequency. The frequency, oh, they gave it to us in megahertz. Oh, my gosh, we have to go from megahertz to kilohertz. Remember how to do that? Three places to the 1.8 megs, three places to the right. That's correct. Turns it into 1,800 kilohertz and you divide the Q of 95 into 1800. Now that's not too hard. Now let's take out that calculator. You know the kids calculator? <sighs> that's it. Blow off all the dust on it because they've already gone to uh, something probably even more better than a calculator. You're going to use it though. Uh, turn the on button on. Hit the clear several times. Yep, got the clear button there. And uh, on the calculator first put in 1800 and then the divided by sign, 
and then the Q is 95, and then hit the equal sign, and presto, is this magic 18.94 kilohertz? And on the test, the answer is 18.9 kilohertz. All right, that was good. You did very well. Now hit the clear button, and let's try another one. What's the half-power bandwidth of a parallel resonant circuit that has a resonant frequency of 7.1 megahertz and a Q of 150? All right, first of all, let's change megahertz to kilohertz. So 7.1 megs would be 7,100 kilohertz. So on my calculator, after hitting the clear button, 7,100, divided by, I just hit that little divided by division sign, uh, 150 equals... 47.3 kilohertz. That's the correct answer. Oh, man, this is easy. Give me another one. Okay, E5A14 says, half-power bandwidth, parallel resonance circuit of 14.25 megahertz, Q of 150. No problem. Megahertz to kilohertz, 14.250 divided by... 150 equals 95. And there's the right answer, 95 kilohertz. Ah, this is easy. Want to do another one? Okay. Half power bandwidth, parallel resonance circuit, 21.15 megs, Q of 95. No problem. 21150 divided by 95 equals 222.63157. 222.6. There's the correct answer. 222.6. How about the half power bandwidth of 3.7 megahertz, Q of 118? That's no problem. Megahertz to kilohertz, 3,700 kilohertz divided by 118 comes out about 31.4 kilohertz. How about uh, the question 14.25 uh, megahertz and a Q of 187? No problem. 14. 15250 kilohertz divided by 187 equals 76.2. Oh, this is great. Gee, I wonder if they allow calculators in the examination room. And the answer is yes, absolutely. They may want to take a look at your calculator and marvel at uh, how smart your kids were for getting them the calculator and then you taking it from them. But yes, calculators are perfectly okay in the exam room. Just make sure you have nothing stored in the memory and you'll be set. All right, let's write down that first formula. One half BW, half power bandwidth, equals kilohertz divided by Q. Remember, they give you the question in megahertz, so you have to put an extra step in there. But it's kilohertz divided by Q. Gosh, you're doing so well, you're probably looking at your kid's calculator going, what are all these extra things like the square root sign? Oh, that's okay. We'll show you. Let's go to question E5A18. What is the resonant frequency of a series RLC circuit? Think of that serious antenna on the back of your new... RV, if R, resistance, is 47 ohms, L, that is inductance, is 50 microhenries, that's the coil, and C, that's capacitance, is 40 picofarads. Well, in the book, we show you a schematic diagram showing a simple series resonant circuit. Now, don't panic. The following formula that I'm soon to give you will carry you through many questions on your upcoming extra class test on both series and parallel circuits. Now, you can throw away the resistance in this problem because we're not going to be needing to work that in our resonance formula. The formula for resonance, write this down. Resonance is equal to 10 to the 6th divided by 2 pi times the square root of LC. Oh, I can now see those eyes rolling backwards. Now, don't panic. Wait till you get home, and then I'll show you how to work this out. All right, first of all, we need to multiply L times C. Don't worry about the micros and the picos. They're going to cancel. So L times C is 50 times 40, because they said 50 microhenries, 40 
picofarads. 50 times 40 is 2,000. Now, because it's under the square root sign, we need to take the square root of 2,000. Easy. On that calculator that your son or daughter loaned you, or maybe you actually had to go out and buy one, just hit the square root sign. Presto. There it is, 44.72. Now, don't clear anything. You've got 44.72 showing on the calculator. Now multiply it by 2 pi. What's 2 pi? 6.28. Just memorize, 2 pi is 6.28. So 6.28x on the calculator, 44.72 equal sign on the calculator, 280.84. All right, now write that down, 280.84. Now, what we have now is we have 1 million that needs to be divided by 280.84. Okay, clear the calculator and enter 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, divided by sign 280.84, equal sign 3560, and a bunch of numbers after that. Ah, 3560.7 kilohertz. Boy, let's look for the answer. Yikes, it's in megahertz. No problem, simply move the decimal point three places to the left, and you come up with answer C. Now, is that that hard? Let's try it again. What's the resonant frequency of a series RLC circuit of R is 47 ohms, L is 40 microhenries, and C is 200 picofarads? First of all, throw R away. We don't need to worry about R. All right, here are the calculator keystrokes. Hit the clear button and enter 40x200 equals, and then hit the square root sign, and then go x6.28, hit the equal sign, and you should end up with 561.7. Now write that one down, 561.7. Hit the clear button on your calculator, then enter 1, 000, 000, 000 divided by 561.7. Hits the equal sign. Oh, thank goodness, it's on a handband, 1780 kilohertz, which equals 1.78 megahertz. Now be careful on the exam. Those question pool committee members tried to fool you. They have 1.78 twice on the exam. One is kilohertz and the other one is megahertz. Well, we know this being a ham test, it's going to end up with 1.78 megahertz. Let's do another one. RLC. R is, don't worry about R. L is 50. C is 10. 50 microhenries, 10 picofarads. 50 x 10 equals, and then square root, x 6.28 equal sign, presto, 140.4. Now write that down, 140.4. Hit the clear button several times, one comma, oh, you don't have a comma on your calculator, one, zero, 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 divided by sign on the calculator, 140.4, equal sign, there it is, 7122 kilohertz, which is 7.12 megahertz, answer D. Be careful. Answer C is 7.12 kilohertz. Boy, they're really trying to fool you on this test. No, don't let them do that. You can verify the correct answer by making sure that what you put down is indeed a ham band in megahertz. All right, resonant frequency, series circuit. R is, don't worry about R, L is 25 microhenries, and C is 10 picofarads. No problem. L times C and do the square root sign, do the multiplication, 6.28, and then divide your answer into 1 million, and let's try that again, 25x10 equals, square root sign, x 6.28 equals 99.29. Write that down, clear, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, divided by button on your calculator, 99. Point, eh, make it 3, equals 10070.5 kilohertz, which is 10.1 megahertz. That's right. Hey, guess what? On the exam, 
they've got 10.1 kilohertz. No, that's wrong. Look for the answer 10.1 megahertz. 10.1 kilohertz is not a ham band. Okay, let's do a couple more. There's a resistance. Throw it away. L is 3 microhenries. C is 40 picofarads. No problem. Do the math, and you'll end up with 14.5 megahertz. 14.5 megahertz. Now, is there a ham band at 14.5? No, there isn't, but there's no other answer that's even close to that. So that is the correct answer. Work out the math and see if you end up, what I did, with 14.5 megahertz. So in this case, it's just outside of the ham band. That means you need to do a little bit more work on that antenna to bring it down to at least 14.350. All right, let's try a resonant frequency. Resistance is given to you at 47 ohms. Throw it away. Four for the microhenries. 20 for the picofarads. And work that out, and you should end up with 17.8 megahertz, another non ham frequency. Be careful, they have a 17.8 kilohertz just waiting for you to speed read the answer. All right, let's do two more. R is 47 ohms. Is that a big deal? Nope, throw it away. L is 8. Microhenry C is 7 picofarads. L times C equals square root times 6.28. And now we come out with 21.3 megahertz. All right. You're doing just great. Actually, it comes out uh, 21,300 kilohertz and move the decimal point three places to the left, and that comes out megahertz. Wait a minute. Incoming note from one of my students. It says... Gordo, if you divide the answer into 10 to the third rather than 10 to the sixth, it would come out megahertz without any additional steps. Okay, now you know. And on the last one, question E5A25, R47 ohms, disregard that, L is 3 microhenries, C is 15 picofarads. Oh no, your calculator just died. The kids didn't put in those great batteries and it died. What are you going to do? Well, if you have to calculate the square root and you haven't got it figured out, first take the multiplication side, 3 times 15. And uh, what do you have with 3 times 15? Well, it comes up 45. Now, you don't have your little square root uh, doodad doer. And you can't remember how in the world to do square roots. Well, remember, square root, 6 times 6 is 36. Square root of 36 would be 6. 7 times 7 is 49. Oh, that's pretty close to 45. So that way we can sort of figure out that the square root of 45 is between 6 and 7, uh, probably closer to 7. And uh, so go ahead and do um, 6.8 times 6.8 comes out 46.2. No, that's too large. How about 6.7 times 6.7 comes out 44.9. That's close enough. So let's use 6.7. Multiply that by 2 pi, 6.28. Divide it into, well, let's make it 10 to the third to come out megahertz. And your answer is 23.74. Sure enough, there it is, 23.7 answer A. Be careful. That's right. They always have an answer in kilohertz, like 23.7 kilohertz, and that would not be correct. Be very careful that matching numbers may have kilohertz and megahertz to throw you off. Now, write down the formula again. Resonant frequency is equal to 10 to the 6 divided by 2 pi times the square root of LC. Now, you'll have on your upcoming test one question based on either the half-power bandwidth problems or resonance. You won't have one on each because, remember, we're still in section E5A, and our last question we just covered was E5A25, and how many questions can they give you out of a group? That's right, just one. So out of the 25 we've just covered, only one question will be on your upcoming test. You will not find five questions on the easy resonant frequency or the half power bandwidth formulas, just one. All right, let's now go to E5B. The charge and discharge curves 
of capacitors and definitions and time constants in RL and RC circuits. Get out your calculator again, you're going to need it, but this one again is not going to be that tough. Here we go, E5B01. Now, for those of you at home, I want you to write down this number. For those of you driving, just sort of do it with your finger anywhere, write down 63. All right, now write down 36. 63, 36, 36, 63, 63, 36, 63, 36, 63. Got it? Don't forget it. The 63 and the 36 will factor into as you are working with time constants. Now, one time constant for question E5B01 refers to the time required for a capacitor, you know those big blue electrolytic capacitors, for a capacitor in an RC circuit to be charged to 63.2% of the supply voltage. When you turn on that hi-fi, it takes a couple seconds before things come on, and when you turn it off, it sort of slowly fades away. Well, that's because of the voltage in the capacitors. They slowly charge up, and they slowly discharge. One time constant is the amount of time to charge a capacitor to 63.2 of the supply voltage. 63.2, either in an RC or the current in an RL circuit. So the term for the time required for a capacitor in an RC circuit to be charged to 63.2% of the supply voltage is one time constant, or what's the term for a time constant in an RL circuit to build up to 63.2 of the maximum value? That is in current. Again, voltage or current, it is one time constant if the number is 63.2. Now, if we go backwards and discharge that capacitor, it discharges in one time constant, just the opposite, 36.8 percent of the initial value of the stored charge, 36.8. So remember 63.2, or 63, and 36.8, just remember 36, 6 and 3 and 3 and 6, forwards and backwards, and you'll be able to solve these problems relatively easy. E5B04, it says the capacitor in an RC circuit is charged to what percentage of the supply voltage after two time constants? Oh, wow. One, we could do in our head, but two? Yeah, two is going to be easy because of the potential answers. You know that one time constant is 63.2 up. Well, the wrong answer would be 36. That would be going the wrong way. Another wrong answer would be way up at 95% after 2. No, the next answer up from 63.2 on your exam is 86.5, and that's the correct answer. So for question E5B04, the capacitor in an RC circuit is charged to what percentage of the supply voltage after 2? Well, after 1, it's 63.2, and the next answer higher is answer C, 86.5. Now, we could have calculated that by doing 36.8 times 63.2 equals 23.26%, and put that into decimal format, it would be 0.368 times 0.632 equals 0.2326. And since the final percent of charge in two time constants is desired, it's only necessary to add the two percentage charges together. So if we add those two together, 63.2 and 23.3 together, we come out with 86.5. But don't knock yourself out. Just go for the next answer above 63.2, and you've got it. But look in my book. In my book, I give you a time constant showing voltage and current percentages. Uh, real nice figure, and that'll help you study how to get through this. Now, let's see if you can do the following in your head. The capacitor in an RC circuit is discharged to what percentage of the starting voltage after 
Well, let's do one time constant. What is it discharged down to? That's right, just the opposite of 63, 36.8. All right, so if it's 2, it's going to be less than that. Their possible answers are 86, no, that's higher. 63, nope. 36, nope, that's 1. The only answer waiting for you that is a valid one is 13.5%. And if you work out the math in my book, you'll be able to see how we get that 13.5%. All right, you're going to do fine on percentages, but now let's really exercise that calculator. Let's take a look at question E5B06. It says, what is the time constant? Now we want to know the time constant of a circuit having two 100 microfarad capacitors and two 470 kilo ohm resistors all in series. Now don't panic. I know that sounds like a huge formula, <laughs> and it is. Time constant for an RC circuit is equal to R times C. Just that simple, R times C. Wow, that's great. Well, it is, but I've got I've got two C's and two R's, and they're in the series, so what do I do? Well, here we go. All right, first part is easy. Now, those capacitors in series, if you have two 100 microfarad caps in series, the total capacitance, remember, two 100 capacitors in series just have, so it's 50 microfarads. All right, there's the C. Now what about the R? Well, we have two 470K in series, so 470 plus 470. Did you get that? Comes out 940K, so it's R times C. R, 940K times C, 50 microfarads. Well, let's first do the microfarads. Clear your calculator. And to go from microfarads to plain old C for farads, it's 0 0.00005, moving the decimal point six places to the left. Got it? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yep. 0 0.00005x, meaning times, 940, and the K is three more zeros, 940000 equals sign 47. That is the correct answer, 47 seconds. Now, be careful that you don't get the decimal points mixed up, but 47 seconds is the answer to that major looking problem. And then it continues to get easier. What's one time constant of a circuit having two 220 microfarad caps and two 1 megohm resistors? Now, this really makes it easy because micros and megs cancel. That's right. So it's just going to be raw numbers. Well, first of all, two 220 mic capacitors in parallel is a larger 440 capacitor. Because remember, these are in parallel. So there's 440. That's one of the numbers. And two 1 megohm resistors in parallel. Resistance is just half of that, or a half a megohm. So it's 0.5. So simply multiply 0.5 times 440 and that comes out 220, and that's the answer, 220 seconds. Oh, man, this is easy. All right, let's do a circuit having a 220 microfarad capacitor in series with one 470K ohm resistor. All right, using megs and micros, convert these over to um, 470,000 for kilo ohms. Let's convert that down to 0.47 megohms. Now that we have megs and megs, 0.47 megohms times 220 microfarad capacitor. Remember, megs and micros cancel. 0.47 times 220 equals 103.4. And rounded down, it comes out 103 seconds. Wow, this is pretty easy. All right, now. Let's go ahead and take a look at question E5B09. And they tie into B10 and B11. How long does it take for an initial charge of 20 volts DC to get all the way down to 7.3 volts DC in a 0.01 microfarad capacitor when a 2 megohm resistor is connected across it? All right, well, 
we can do this one pretty easily. In one time constant with 20 volts, we'll drop down to 36.8%. So 0.368, that's percentage going over to decimal, times 20 equals 7.36 volts, which matches the voltage referred to in the question. So they say, how long does it take? And the answer is, we just figured it out, one time constant. Now, using the megs times micros again to calculate the time constant as 2 times 0.01, and that takes place in 0.02 seconds. Now, if you remember on the exam that they've cut out some of these time constant questions, and they ask for one time constant, and then they jump to four time constants. In the next question, E5, B10. How long does it take for initial charge of 20 volts to get all the way down to 0.37 volts DC, 0.01 microfarad capacitor, 2 mega ohm resistor across it? Well, the discharge continues. Now, refer to the time constant chart that we had in the book, and they're now saying the voltage is down to 0.37 volts. If you work through the time constants, the fourth time constant discharge reduces the voltage across the capacitor to 1 volt times 0.368, which equals 0.368 rounded to 0.37, which they ask in the question. Now write down 0.37, four time constants. Four time constants times 0.02, which we had in one time constant, is equal to 0.08 seconds, the correct answer. Be sure to remember one time constant for this circuit is 2 times 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 seconds. 4 time constants is 0 0.02 times 4, which equals 0 0.08. Now, looking at the incorrect answer, you can always spot the right answer because in this question, the closest answer is 0 0.02 seconds, and you know that's only one time constant. The incorrect answers are 450 and 1350 seconds, and that's going to be to a much higher voltage. In fact, E5B11, how long does it take for an initial charge of 800 volts DC to drop down to 294 in a 450 microfarad cap and a 1 mega ohm resistor? Well, since we're working this out on the calculator, 800 volts DC and a 450 microfarad capacitor, one mega ohm resistor connected across it. Since the voltage across a capacitor drops to 36.8% of its initial value in one time constant, what will be the voltage across it in one time constant? 800 times 0.368 equals 294 volts. Now, write down 294. That's the voltage in this particular question, so we know it's one time constant. And remember, time constant equals megs times micros. Remember, R times C. Well, 1 is the meg. 450 is the micro. 1 times 450 is 450 seconds in one time constant. Hey, good job. You can spot the correct answer on this one because 450 is found in the question for the microfarad capacitor. 450 in the answer. All right, one of these 11 questions may be on your examination. Only one. So if you had a hard time on this, don't worry about it. The last 11 questions that we've been covering for, gosh, many minutes, only one question can be chosen for your upcoming extra class test. All right, take a break, and then when we come back, we're going to jump right into our third area, impedance diagrams and the Smith chart. All right, you ready for the Smith chart? E5C01. Now, take a look in my book at page 113, and you'll spot that Smith chart. It's an invaluable graph for calculating the impedance along amateur radio transmission lines, and many times you will see a completed Smith chart, usually generated by a computer, illustrating the resonance of a commercial quality VHF or UHF collinear base station and repeater antenna. Now, if you look carefully at the Smith chart, you'll see two circles. Resistance circles centered on a resistance axis, all tangent to an open circuit point, 
and portions of reactance circles, those are arcs, fanning out from the resistance axes and passing through the same open circuit point. The inductive reactance curves are plotted positively from the resistance axes and capacitive reactance curves negatively. Inductive, I am positive. I for inductive reactance am positive. Capacitive reactants are negative. Capneg. Capacitive reactants are negative. You'll need to know this a lot for some upcoming problems that without even taking out the calculator, you'll be able to solve. Just remember, I am positive. Inductive reactants curves are plotted positively. What type of graph can be used to calculate impedance along a transmission line? That's the Smith chart. What type of coordinate system is used in the Smith chart? Resistance circles and reactance arcs. Think of that letter C looking like an arc for reactance arcs. And you'll see again in my book the Smith chart. What type of calculations can be performed using a Smith chart? The answer is impedance and SWR values in transmission lines. What are two families of circles that make up the Smith chart? Resistance and reactance. What type of chart is this in figure E5-1? Oh, I know what that is. That is the Smith chart. On the Smith chart shown in figure E5-1, what is the name for the large outer circle? Circle, circle, bounding the coordinate portion of the chart. Well, that is the reactance axes, the outer circle, bounding the coordinate portion of the chart, reactance axes. On the Smith chart, what is the only straight line shown? The straight line is the resistance axes. And when we go through a process of normalizing with regard to a Smith chart, that is reassigning impedance values with regard to the prime center. What is the third family of circles which are added to a Smith chart during the process of solving problems? That is the standing wave ratio circles. So begin to know the Smith chart. And you'll do just fine on your upcoming examination. Now, one more time, let's go ahead and talk about that Smith chart real quickly. Calculations performing a Smith chart, impedance and SWR in a transmission line. Circles, resistance, and reactance. Name for the large outer circle bounding the coordinate portion of the chart. That is the reactance axes. Straight line, resistance axes. Normalizing is reassigning impedance values with regard to the prime center. Prime center. Third family of circles, standing wave ratio circles. All right, now it's time to take a big break because you're going to need it shortly. We're going to jump over if you're on audio cassette to the back side of this audio cassette and uh, start with rectangular and polar coordinates. If you have your kids safety calculator like a safety blanket bring it along you better put in fresh batteries but don't panic I'm gonna show you on rectangular and polar coordinates how to solve many of the problems without even using the calculator. So take a break we'll meet you on the flip side if you're on cassette tapes and I'll see you back in just a few minutes. This is Gordo, WB6NOA. See you back with rectangular and polar coordinates.